Loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we consider the challenge to look towards Christ in a world that is calling for our attention to be focused in other directions. And this morning, as we consider the word, we ask for your spirit to guide our hearts and minds to the place where we can comprehend as well as ask, Lord, what would you have me to do? And now speak to us, take what has been put to the page and find a place to insert it into our hearts and to transform our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I know some of you might be wondering, what is non perishable food. I recently read a story. It was featured by NPR. Uh, NPR is a very well-known news network, a very well-known news source. And I found this story on NPR.org. It was a featured story in a section on their website called Food for Thought. It was called apocalyptic chow. And when I heard about that, I thought, wow, what an interesting title. And as I read further, it was about a well-known televangelist that was advertising, as I share with you his own words, survival food when the world is falling apart. A quote-unquote survival food sampler bucket contained 154 meals costing $135. He suggested that when the world is falling apart, if you buy a bucket of apocalyptic chow, you'll be ready when the world is falling apart. His advertising tagline was, imagine the world is dying and you're having a breakfast fit for kings. The televangelist also wrote, you'll be having parties when the world is coming apart. Now, I couldn't help but kept reading into the story because I thought to myself, I know this televangelist. I met him. I won't mention his name. I won't say that he was at one time had a doghouse with air conditioning, but I um, won't tell you specifically who he is. But he had an amusement park many years ago. And you probably don't know who I'm talking about, but don't mention any names. But um, I want to just say on some things he lost his way, but I remember me- meeting him once when my wife and I went to Branson, Missouri, And I pulled him aside after his, they had kind of a breakfast set or lunch set where people were coming to this uh, restaurant and they played music and he and his wife would have a religious set. And afterward, I couldn't help but walk up to him and he said, um, as I introduced myself, told him where I was from, he pulled me aside, he said, I want you to tell Mr. Shelton, thank you for me. Because some of you may know that um, when Jim Baker spent some time incarcerated after he came out, he said his church turned their back on him and would not accept him back in. And he said, and I stayed in the mountains of of, of North Carolina and I just watched through ABN. That's a good amen right there. And he said, I want you to tell Mr. Shelton, lots of my view, a lot of my views changed from watching 3ABN. And I believe in sincerity, he is doing what he believes is best. But this article, I remember him talking about that. And there are other televangelists that talked about uh, buying bungalows and underground grain silos, preparing for the apocalypse that is to come. Well, in the continuation of the story... At the NPR kitchen, they decided to prepare and to taste some of the survival food. Here's what they revealed. And I read as I quote. (laughs) They said, save for the pudding. (laughs) The dishes were extremely salty and had odd lingering aftertastes. We couldn't agree on which was worse the thick potato soup that felt like eating wet cement, 
or the strong chemical overtones of the chocolate pudding, or the disturbing radioactive orange of the macaroni and cheese. <laughs> they said, we concluded, it's awful, it's trash. And I thought to myself, so much for apocalyptic chow. Now, the reason why this story interested me is because there are many people that believe you got to store up stuff. You got to store up food and weapons and clothing and lamps. And some Adventists are canning and storing up peaches, thinking that when it all falls apart, at least I'll have some canned peaches and some apricots and some dried fruit for the time of trouble. But my brethren and sisters, there is a satanic agency that is ahead of us that is going to require more than some apocalyptic chow. Can you say amen? The time is coming when our only concern will be who shall be able to stand. Which brings us to our scripture reading for today. Revelation 12 and verse 12. This is a preview that says to us we are going to need a whole lot more than dried food, canned peaches, and powdered macaroni and cheese. Revelation says to us in Revelation 12 and verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. And so as I was thinking this week when the snow was coming down and I'm asking the Lord, Wendy, what do I preach about this week? Because from Sabbath to Sabbath, I've been challenged, even in my devotional life, to come up with a new sermon. But this week the Lord said, now there's some sermons that are like recipes. You preached it many years ago, but the recipe wasn't complete yet. And God has allowed me Terry, to go back into some of my old sermons. This one takes me back to 2007, and I pulled it out, and I realized with new and continually converted eyes, I'm beginning to see scriptures that I didn't see before in a way that makes more sense now than it did back in 2007. And so this message is not about canned food or powdered potatoes and, and a powdered chocolate pudding. This message is for those that are looking for genuine, non-perishable food. You see, before God restores the world right side up, it is going to be turned upside down. And we're just getting glimpses in politics and religion. We're getting glimpses on the war front as things are being agitated between Russia and the United States and the borders of the countries that they can invade. There is instability on the political side. There is instability on the military side. There is instability on the financial side. There's talks about changing money over sooner than later to digital currency. We don't have any idea of what's coming down the pipe. But I want to say that if you think the answer for the future is going to be your stockpile then you are looking in the wrong direction. The agenda of the kingdom of darkness is to cut off our supply line to God. That's why the food that we should be eating on a daily basis is the word of God. Spending time storing up what David stored up. He said, thy word have I did what? Hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If the word of God is not being stored in your mind and in your heart, then there's a time coming that you will not be able to draw on the fresh bread of life, the only thing that can sustain you. If Jesus drew on the bread of life in his time of trial, what makes us any different? Satan wants to discourage us. He wants to cause us to feel abandoned by God. And if you focus in the wrong direction, that is going to be your experience. But I want to tell you today, God will not abandon us. In our darkest hour, when we stay connected to God, God will deliver us. Because God is not dependent on us, but we are surely dependent on God. 
when I look at the context of what the Lord led me to look back at a second time, very few stories in Scripture illustrate how dependable God is, like the siege that took place in Samaria. If you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like you to turn to the book of 2 Kings. We're going to walk through 2 Kings in just a moment. But to lay the foundation, this story covers a number of chapters. It doesn't just land in chapter 6 of 2 Kings. It, it's laid the foundation in chapter 4 and 5 and 6 and then 7 and 8. You find the story develops itself. There's a high point and then there's a focal point. But before we go any further, I want to just set the foundation. You see, the Syrian army came to arrest Elisha, the prophet. Because they were concerned how they were not able to sneak up on the Israelites. Every time they made a plan to invade Israel, somehow the Israeli army knew. The leaders, the kings of Israel knew. Before the invasion, they knew and the Syrian king said, how is it that before we even carry out our exploits, they already know? And somebody said, there is a, there's a prophet named Elisha that even knows what you're thinking about when you're in your bedchamber. Let me make a point. It was not Elisha that knew, but it was God that knew. You see, God understands in the secret chambers of our lives. God sees beyond the eyes of humanity. So they came to arrest Elijah, and you may remember the story, when they surrounded the house of Elisha, Elisha's servant out, went outside and said, at last, master, what shall we do? His servant thought that Elisha was going down that day, and Elisha prayed the prayer, which was the focus of our song. Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. You see, in difficult moments, the prayer that each Christian should have is, Lord, open my eyes that I may see what my natural eyes have not yet beheld. If we would use spiritual eyes, we could see beyond the difficulty that faces us on a day-by-day -day basis. God opened the servant's eyes, and the servant of Elisha saw chariots of fire surrounding the army. And Elisha prayed for God to blind the Syrian army. And the Syrian army suffered a setback because their plans were once again thwarted. You see, my brethren, when we are on God's side, God can turn the tide in our favor on any given day. The Apostle Paul in Romans 8 verse 31 reminds us, what then shall we say to these things? Let's say the second part together. If God is for us, who can be against us? I've had experiences in my life, I won't take the time to share them today, but growing up in ministry, I've had times when I've had very powerful people stand against me, very influential people stand against me, very well-connected people stand against me. And I'm only here today because even when I made ridiculous decisions, I discovered in the aftermath that God was still working out the kinks in my life to pull me through. So, could, so today I can say, if God is for us, who can be against us? When you read the story, in an unusual twist, and I'm not going to take the time to cover that today. I want you to read that this afternoon, since you have a little bit more time because of the weather. But when you read the book of 2 Kings chapter 6, in a very unusual twist, and think about it, the enemies of Elisha, the enemies of Israel, is now surrounding the house of Elisha, the prophet. He prays for God to blind them. And at a moment when he could have destroyed his enemy, in an unusual twist, instead of destroying the Syrian army, they lead the Syrian army unharmed to Samaria, and then they feed them. Now think about that for a moment. In a moment that they could have wiped out the very army that was attempting to wipe out Israel as well as Elisha, he prayed for God to blind them. And then he led the blinded Syrian army to Samaria 
where they placed food before them and fed them. Now, how many of us would think about treating our enemies that way? How many of us would think about treating people that are not good to us as kindly as Elisha did? How many of us would say, this is the moment that God has given me the opportunity to take care of them, but we choose something else. We choose not to take care of them, but to behave as God would have us to behave, to not take advantage of the vulnerable. And the Bible has pointed out that even if the vulnerable that are now under the capturing arm of God, when God stands in our behalf and he, and he, and he handcuffs those who would have us and do us harm, remember what Joseph said, what, what the devil intended for evil, God did what? He used it to make it good. So there are moments when you experience difficult things that God is going to test you how you behave in that very moment. At the very moment that they could have wiped out their armies, God said to Elijah and the Israelites, do not take advantage of the vulnerable. And that's why the wise man Solomon wrote these words. Because how we treat our enemies, and I'm going to say this again, how we treat those that we don't get along with, or those that we may have had difficulty with, or those that are a constant grind on our nerves. Do I need to keep going? Or those that sometimes we just don't see eye to eye with and we'd love them just to disappear. Those are the moments that the way we treat them will be a testament to our connection to Christ. How do I know that? Proverbs 25 Look at the words of a wise man who understood the wisdom of God. Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. Look at the example that was later repeated by the Apostle Paul. Solomon says, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will do what? Reward you. You see, this act of kindness to their bitterest enemy was evidence that Elisha and Israel was under the direct influence of God. Let me make this very practical today. You know, we have difficult times, do we not? There are times and moments when, maybe even in our own home, uh, earlier this week, I'm going to tell a like, cute little story. My wife and I are mature enough to handle this. So this week, you know, the snow locks you in. She couldn't go to work, and we just, we woke up on the wrong side of the bed. I woke up on her side, and she woke up on my side. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Not physically, but mentally. And when we got up, we just dove right into what we had to do for that day, make phone calls, and we didn't start with our devotions. And you know, when you don't start with your devotions, something gets between you and God that could have been avoided if you started your day right. I don't need any husbands and wives to say amen at this moment. But so we were having that day, and she was chipper as ladies can be. You know, sometimes women can be fast off the cuff, verbally. And we guys just have to endure it. We figure it's going to end pretty soon. But sometimes it doesn't end when we'd like it to. Come on, say amen, somebody. Not the husbands, just the single men. And um, that's, what, that's how it was that day. And we were sitting at the table, and I just kind of, she had one common too many that I just didn't like. I said, you know, I don't like, I don't like that. And she said, I said, I don't like it when you do that. I just don't like it. See, what don't you like? I said, that, that attitude, I don't like it. And, you know, she could have said, fine, well, that's your problem. But I praise God, my wife grew. Because a few minutes later, she came and apologized and offered a peace offering, some nice ginger tea, and, um, and we were fine. 
Let me make a point. It takes a real humble Christian. What word did I say? Humble. To recognize that you need to change your ways. And I'm not just saying this applies to my wife because sometimes I have those days. But it takes a humble heart to recognize that at those pivotal moments, the way you treat each other will be evidence as to whether or not you are a Christian or not. You see, that act of kindness to their enemies illustrates to the world the difference between a non-Christian and a Christian. There are some people that I know, you know, they don't know the church, they don't, they don't call the church, they don't come to church, they don't, they don't know where the church is located until they have a need. And if you've been in that position before, you know, you hear from some certain people only when they have a need. You know, they know the pastor's phone number or they find a way to get through to the pastor and they have a need. And this happened this week. And the person that I was thinking about uh, at several occasions had asked for help. And I, I kept telling them over and over, if you just give your life to the Lord, you wouldn't be in this predicament. But this, is a genu- this was a moment that the Lord was testing me. Because he was saying to me, are you going to lean on the way you feel about them? Or are you going to look at their real situation? And I decided to take into consideration the context of what they were facing. And I said, okay, Lord, this is one of those moments when it's not about me. It's a test. And I remember this passage in James that I want to leave with you before we dive into the story. I want you to grab this because this is vitally important as it relates to the genuineness of our Christianity. James 2, verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's a powerful passage. It's saying to you, when you have the perfect right, like Elisha in the Israeli army, you've got your enemies, they're blinded, they don't know where they are, they're in your land, they're in Samaria, you can wipe them out and minimize this threat from that point on. But what do you do instead? You feed them. You give them food to eat. You give them water to drink, like David When Saul threw his javelin at David, when David came to to calm his fears while he's playing his harp, Saul throws a javelin at David, and had it not been for the interposition of God, he would have pinned David to the wall with a spear. There were several other occasions when Saul tried to get rid of David. And David had those moments once Saul was sleeping, and David went and cut off the piece of his garment and showed him later on. He said, you know, I could have killed you on many occasions. But I've heard the Lord says, touch not the Lord's anointed and do his prophets no harm. And that does not just apply to people that are working for the Lord. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that in our homes and in the community, the way that people perceive us as merciful will say a lot about our connection to Christ. It'll go a lot farther than arguing over the Sabbath. It will go a lot farther than convincing them about the state of the dead, about the 2300 days or any prophecies that we understand in scripture. When people see the way that you treat them in the community, it says a whole lot more about your connection to Christ than anything else. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. But now let's get back to the story. Second Kings chapter six, and we, let's look at verse 23. You see, after being blinded, The fear of God was so complete on the Syrian army that they decided, this is not the position I want to find myself in again. And so they decided, we're not going back. We're not messing with Elisha. We're not messing with Israel. Notice 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 23, how the Bible unfolds this beautiful story. Speaking about what they did for the Syrian army. Then he prepared a great feast for them. He didn't give them cheese and crackers. (laughs) He said, we're going to really do it up. We're going to make sure that our enemies are full. 
I could only imagine, I got to peek into this story for a brief moment. I could only imagine when the Lord opened the eyes of the Syrians, Terry, and they realized they were in Samaria and they smelled the food before them on the table. They probably said to one another, I bet you it's poisoned. I bet you this is our last meal. And so the captain may have said to one of the soldiers, eat it first. No, that's a direct command, eat it. And he, tastes pretty good. You know, you've heard of Castro, Fidel Castro. He had a lot of lookalikes. And when people brought food for him, he would have his brothers taste the food. Or somebody else in his, in his palace taste the food. So if they died, he didn't eat it. I can imagine in that moment when the Lord opened the Syrian army's eyes and they're, they're, they're surrounded by a great feast and they're about to eat and they're probably thinking to themselves, this is just, they, there's something about this meal that just doesn't sit right. They're going to kill us. This is our last meal. So all that time, they're waiting for the axe to come down. The Bible says, then he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, I can imagine them saying, this is it. We're going to get shot now. And then he says, okay, see you later. Come on, put yourself in the story. You're probably saying, see you later. Are you saying we could leave? Yeah, you can leave. They're probably waiting for any moment for the guns to start cracking or the, or, the, or, the, or the arrows to start flying or something to happen to them. I'm sure that when they got home, they talked about that story a long time. That's why the text ends this way. And he sent them away and they went to their master. And <laughs> look what it says. So the bands of Syrian raiders came no more into the land of Israel. We are not going back. And the Bible tells us when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You want to see the tide change in your favor? Stop being nice to people. I don't know what you guys ate this morning. That, that requires an amen. amen. Stop being nice to folk. Stop being... Stop being righteous Christians. Start being Christian Christians. You know, some people are good for you. I, my sister called me this last week, and she said, oh, you got to see this movie. I said, what movie? My sister's not a Christian, but she said, oh, it's a Christian movie. Still didn't see it. But I said, what's it about? She said, it's about a pastor who went throughout his community, and he found people that were down and out and people that were homeless and people that were druggies, and he brought them to his church. He helped them get their feet back on the ground. They're now active church members. They're holding offices. They are new in Christ. And he said, but the twist in the movie is they forgot who they used to be, and now they are mean to the people that are where they used to be. They are, they're, they're, they're merciless. So they're walking. They show them walking through the community. She's telling me about the story. She said, now... The object of that is don't ever forget where you've come from because God doesn't redeem us to be in his showcase. He redeems us to be an example of who he is. Amen. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. But there's a saying that goes this way. Those that fail to learn from the past are doomed to repeat it. And that's what happened to the Syrian army. Go to verse 24 of 2 Kings. As time passed... The new leader forgot what had taken place in the distant past of the Syrian army. It says in verse 24 of 2 Kings chapter 6, And it happened after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. Now, this was not the same army. This was not the same leader. This was a different general. This was a different commander. A new commander now forgot the past experience of the Syrian army, and the last leader was no longer in command. So this new leader called Ben-Hadad, that means the son of Hadad, that means the god of storms. So to besiege the city, it means to cut off every line of supply. 
so completely that they either give in or they stay inside the city and die for lack of food or lack of water. So they surrounded the city of Samaria. And the Bible made it so clear that this, this siege was so complete, they could not get out of the city. No one could get into the city. There was no food allowed. And if you notice recently on the news, that's what is being talked about, that if Russia decides to invade Ukraine, that there's going to be an embargo. That's a new word for siege. They're going to cut off their supply lines. Countries are going to join in the embargo. They're not going to let certain supplies get into Russia. And Russia keeps saying, we are not going to invade Ukraine. But they said, if they do, there's going to be somewhat of a siege against the country of Russia. And a siege means you try to survive with your own supplies, but if there are things that we know you need from all the other surrounding nations, we're going to cut that supply off until you give in or you fold. And the siege was so complete that it came to pass they were running out of food. And when you read the story, I'm not going to read this right now. Okay, I'll read it. Look at verse 25. Since you insist, since you insist, I heard your silent insistence. Look at verse 25. It's not on the screen, but the Lord made it clear to me. Look at this. Verse 25. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and indeed they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for eight shekels of silver. Eighty shekels of silver. And one-fourth of a cab, or a pint, of dove's droppings for five shekels of silver. Now that's bad. They were not eating donkey's legs. They had finished that already. There were no, no more fried donkey legs. No donkey shoulders left. All that was left was the head. So they're now selling the head for two pounds of silver. And they're no longer eating the dove. Let's get a little gross here for a moment. You'll forget when you get to fellowship lunch. But they're no longer eating the dove all that's left of the dove is the dove's droppings. And they're selling that for two ounces of silver. What makes it even worse is not that they're selling it, but they're eating it. This is a good time not to swallow. <laughs> Circumstances got so dismal that things went from bad to worse. And the king lost hope that any relief would come. Look at verse 26 and 27. The Syrian king said, the Sumerian king said, this is bad. We are in trouble. Verse 26 of 2 Kings 6. Then as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried out to him saying, help me, my lord, O king. Hmm. And he said, if the Lord does not help you, where can I find help for you? From the threshing floor? or from the wine press. In other words, he said, there's no place in this, there's no place in Samaria that we can find help. If God is not going to help you, there's no way that I can help you. In other words, if we can't count on God, look at our circumstances. Where are we going to find help from? So this woman is pleading for there to be help. But look at what she inquired about, just when you think it couldn't get any worse. Look at verse 28 and 29 of 2 Kings chapter 6. Then the king said to the woman, What's troubling you? And she answered, This woman said to me, Give your son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. I know you're quiet because I'm telling you that's one the hard picture. Things got to go from bad to bad to worse to worse. Verse 29, the story is a gruesome story. You think that watching movies are bad? There's some stories in the Bible that would top any Jason movie you watch. You want drama? Read the Bible. Look at verse 29. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her the next day, 
give your son that we may eat him. He said, not my son. Oh, no, not my son. So she hid him. And by the way, that's not even the focus of the story. It's just showing you that in life, let me make some application so you can get your mind off of eating donkey's heads and doves droppings and children. Sometimes we are faced by such dire circumstances in our lives that we may look around our house to things that used to bring us joy and all of a sudden they lose their attraction. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You can't pick up the remote. You don't want to hear the news. You don't want to listen to music. You don't want to hear anybody call you and tell you God is going to bring you through. You don't want to hear anything. It's getting from worse to worse, as the kids would say, to worser. When things seem like they couldn't get any worse, they did. Donkey's heads, doves droppings, and eating children. And instead of the king leading, leading the Sumerians to pray, he decides that the reason why we're in this predicament is this new king, this new commander, remembered what Elisha did to the army many generations ago. Look at verse 31. He blamed their circumstances on Elisha. Then he said, Go do so to me and more also, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on him today. The king decided to take out his frustrations on Elisha, the prophet. And that's how it is sometimes. When we are frustrated, the best thing to do in your moments of frustration is stand still and let God work things out. Because I, I've seen people blame other family members. You know, I'm in, this, I'm in this predicament because of him or because of her or because of them. And they look to blame their circumstances on human vessels when they don't realize. Because if you look at the story, God could have easily prevented this from happening to Samaria. He could have easily stepped in between them and their adversaries. But the story had a deeper meaning than just their temporal needs. And as sad as it sounds, eating children and your diet becoming a gruesome thing to even focus on, there was a deeper lesson in the story. That's why verse 33, I'm reading this in the New Living Translation. I love the way it says it here. After blaming Elisha, then the king of Samaria started blaming God. And look what he said. The king said, If it is the Lord who has brought this trouble on us, why should I wait any longer for the Lord? It is the Lord who brought this trouble on us. Why should I wait any longer for the Lord? Now, I would assume that today most of us are doing pretty good. Because a lot of times when people are not doing very well, they don't, you know, I know today is a unique situation, but a lot of times when you don't see people, you can conclude that they're going through something. Now, we're living in a COVID environment. That's one contributor. We have bad weather. That's another contributor. But generally, when people are going through difficulty, they don't want to be around people. They don't want to be in a fellowship. They don't want to hear anybody trying to encourage them or, or change the focus. I've heard a person once called me and they blamed God for what they were going through. And I said, God didn't do that. The enemy did that. God doesn't take family members. He doesn't kill children. He doesn't do that. They were so determined to blame God, but they said, then God could have prevented it. God can prevent anything. But not being a cynical God that wants people to eat their children. These actions that took place in Samaria was not because God refused to help the Syrians. It's because God was looking for the leader in Samaria. God was looking for the leader in Samaria to lead the people before the Lord to honor him. 
Same thing happened to the children of Israel when they were traveling from the land of Egypt. Those that chose to dishonor God, the blessings of God was withheld. And God brought them to difficult and straight places so that in those difficult moments, he can teach them what it means to turn away from the difficulty to the God that can solve every dilemma we face. That's why David the psalmist wrote these words. And this is something we have to learn because sometimes we allow the challenges of life to cause us to blame God. Notice what David the psalmist wrote in Psalm 27, verse 14. Can we read this together? Let us read this together. Here we are. What's the first word? Wait on the Lord. And what? Be of good courage. And he shall together strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Have you ever waited on the Lord? Now, there's a way to wait on God. You don't wait on God being angry at God or wait on God pouting that you didn't get your way. You got to wait on God in the way that he knows it will build your faith. In the book that often is connected to sorrow and sadness and lamentation, that very book brings us a prescribed way that we should wait on the Lord. Look at Lamentations 3, verse 25 and 26. Praise God, a book that's often known for sorrows brings to us the perfect prescription on how the Christian should wait on the Lord. Here it is. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who does what? Seeks him. Look at this. It is good that one should hope and wait, how? Quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You know why? Because too often we complain, we complain, we complain, and then we give up at the moment just before the answer comes. I'm not going to wait any longer. I've been waiting, I've been waiting, I've been waiting. The king of Samaria, I've been waiting. God's not turning things around. So they see the faithlessness of the king, and it leads the people to despondency and discouragement, and they take their solutions into their own hands. God didn't say to them that they had to eat donkey's heads and dove's droppings and God forbid, he didn't prescribe them eating their children, but their lack of faith and trust in God, they sought ways of solving their own issues. And I can say to you today, many of us go to lengths that we should never have gone to because we refuse to wait quietly on the Lord. I have people that leave the church because they say, God didn't answer my prayer quickly enough. So I don't need God any longer. And I asked them, if you can't trust God, who can you trust? If God is not the answer to the dilemma I'm facing, who else has the answer? If God is not the one that can turn the tide in our own favor, who can do better than God? No one. And we've had a lot of experiences. I was saying to somebody not too long ago as we were visiting in California, we were sitting around... <laughs> People were sitting around telling their COVID stories. When we were out in California not too long ago, we were sitting in a room with some speakers that were part of the Three Angels Messages weekend, and they were all sharing their COVID stories, how many times they had COVID and how many times and what they went through and what they faced. And, and I'm sitting there working on my sermon, and, and then one of them turned to me and said, well, how many times have you had COVID? I said, never did. Thank you, honey. They said, you never had COVID? I said, no. I said, I did what I'm supposed to do, what I felt convicted to do, and I put the rest in the Lord's hands. So oh, I've never had COVID. You never had it? No. And it was surprising because every pastor in that circle had it at least twice. And folk came up to us that we knew were sick. And somebody warned us, look out for them. They're going to try to get you sick. And we ended up hugging them and realized later on that God turned the tide in our favor. There is something called faith and there's something called presumption. When you do your part, God promises to do his part. But let's not throw caution into the wind and say, I'm not going to wear my seatbelt because I've never had a car accident. I'm not going to wear my helmet. What's the chances of me falling off my motorcycle? That's a great risk. In the story of Samaria, 
the king lost faith in God, and his lack of trust in God affected the congregation. How do you think this church would be if I came up here every Sabbath morning complaining how bad life is? Man, we, got, we need to go to West Frankfurt. Pastor always talks about bad, how bad life is, complaining about his situation, got stuck in the driveway. No. Our job is to bring people to the point where we can say things may be bad, but God is still God, and he can still turn the tide in your favor when the time comes. Yeah. Got to wait on God. So while the king is complaining, the very prophet that was being maligned by the king of Samaria is the very prophet that God gave a word of encouragement at the time when they needed it. Look at 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 1. And I'm going to read this once again in the New Living Translation because I like the way it said it. The Lord gives Elijah a word of encouragement to show the king of Samaria that God did not forsake them. Elijah replied, hear this message from the Lord. That's the job of the leader. Encourage the people regardless of how bad it is. This is what the Lord says. But look at the time frame of God's ability to turn things around. By this time tomorrow, in the markets of Samaria, this is powerful, five quarts of fine flour will cost only half an ounce of silver. Now I want you to grab that before I go to the next verse because I think you missed it. So I'm going over here so you can get it because you may have missed it over there. They don't have any flour in Samaria. The menu is donkey heads, doves dropping while supplies last, and they're running around town looking for children for tomorrow's barbecue. Let's get a little gross for a moment. That's today. But Elijah said, on tomorrow, there's going to be so much flour in the markets of Samaria that the price is going to drop because supply is going to supersede demand. Now that was a perfect time to say amen. Because God could so completely turn your circumstances around. Here it is. Today, you are wiping... Oh, i, I, I got to get a little gross here. You're wiping off the, the remnants of a child's foot from your lips. And Elisha says, you should have waited till tomorrow. Because tomorrow, there's going to be so much flour in the market, demand is going to be far less than supply. There's going to be so much food in this city that they're going to have to drop the price just to get it sold. Come on, somebody. Did it it ever happen to you that God comes through so completely that your supply is so overwhelming that you just can't exhaust God's blessings. Oh, I wish I could tell you some of the stories, how God has come through so many times in my wife and I life so completely that the supply exceeds the demand. In other words, Elijah was saying, we're going to have Thanksgiving tomorrow. Uh, On the heels of your grossest meal, we're going to have some good food tomorrow. And he continues. He says, not only will five quarts of fine flour cost you only half an ounce of silver, But he says, and 10 quarts, and 10 quarts of barley grain will cost only half an ounce of silver. That's that good stuff. In other words, God is going to give us so much that we're not going to know how to even handle it. Which brings me to my third point. I only have two more points left. When you feel like giving up, I'm going to say that again. When you feel like giving up, remember, God owns tomorrow. But now, there's a downside to the complaining of the king. (laughs) Look at verse 2. That's why you have to be careful. Stay clear of folk that are always complaining about how bad God is. 
This is a passage that reminds us, don't hang out with people that doubt God's promises. Look at verse 2 of 2 Kings chapter 7. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? No, how is this going to happen? And he said, in fact, and this is Elijah responding, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Because you doubted God, you ain't getting none. Now, I don't know how they were going to prevent that, but they're going to be so stunned by God's ability to provide. He says, because you doubted God, you are not going to benefit from the abundance of God's blessings. It's going to happen, but you're not going to get any. <laughs> and I have to say it. With God, there is no such thing as the word impossible. There are no impossible moments with God. Now let's, let's shift the story. So you got, you got the Syrian army besieging Samaria, you got folk in Samaria that have indigestion. I won't repeat what they ate. And then you have the prophecy of Elisha saying, by tomorrow it's going to be different. But outside of the city, there are four men who are in worse condition than everybody in the city. Let's go to verse 3. Just when you think it can't get any worse. You know, you know what I like about this story? Some of you guys are shocked but that I'm so excited. You know why, what I like about this story? You know what I like about this story? Is that God is showing us one of the worst stories in Scripture about circumstances. Chris and Mike. One of the worst stories in Scripture about things that you can experience. Because you can't find many stories in the Bible where people got to the point of eating their children. I think it's one of the rare ones. That's in the city. Then they're surrounded by an angry army that's, that's bent on their death. And then the king, the leader, doubts God. The prophecy comes. They won't benefit from it. But outside the city, there are four men who are in worse condition than anybody in the city. Let's look at these guys. Let's look at them together. Are you ready? Verse 3. That's why I love the phrase, now. It's, it's, the transitions in the scripture are amazing. In other words, when you think things are bad, now check this out. Now, there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here till we die? You know what it means to be leprous? It means that you've forgotten what it feels like to be embraced because nobody wants to touch you. You see, the Bible brought that word in because leprosy is synonymous with sin. When sin is so dark, you feel estranged. You want to be able to be touched, but nobody wants to be around you. People that are leprous have lost their sensitivity. They look hopeless. Their condition is the condition that nobody wants to even be around. They don't even smell good. Matter of fact, leprous people don't even like themselves. And worse than that, they feel outcasts. And the only thing that they look forward to is death, waiting to relieve their suffering. So God now turns the picture from a horrible situation inside the city, angry army outside the city, and these four leprous men who, even if they had a good meal, let's say we're lepers anyway, we're going to die. But the songwriter says, Jesus is there to comfort and cheer just when I need him most. Look at verses 4 and 5. So they assessed their situation, and they said the following. <laughs> oh, we are so much like these four leprous men. If we say we will enter the city, they're assessing the situation. The famine is in the city. We're going to die there. 
If we sit here, we're going to die. Now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. I mean, look at this. If they keep us alive, well, we shall live. And if they kill us, what's going to happen? We're only going to die anyway. It can't get any worse. Look at verse 5. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. Okay, okay. This is only for those who didn't catch up yet to the story. They said to one another, what just happened? Wasn't the army just, wasn't the army here all day, all week, last week, last month? Where are they? Where are they? You see, this is the part of the story where Jeremiah the prophet chimes in and reminds us of what God can do. There's never a situation that we face that God cannot reverse to the shock of our perception. I don't know if I asked you to give me a story about something that God did that's, that's so profound that you can't even imagine God did it. This is one of those moments. Because here they are, their flesh is rotting, they're falling apart, and they decide, we're not going to go in there because we know we're going to starve, so let's go to the ones who do have food, and if they're merciful, then that's fine, but if not, we're going to die anyhow. And they go to the camp of the Syrians. Now, why do they go to the camp of the Syrians? Because the Syrians have enough food to continue to preserve them while they besiege Israel, their supplies are continually being replenished, so they have everything they need. They have food, they have clothing, they have a place to sleep, they have all the amenities, they got everything. They got nice cars, nice tents, they got, nice every, they got everything they need. So they said, let's go where they got all the stuff they need. And they might look at us and say, they're lepers anyway, let's give them something to eat because they're going to die anyhow. And they go there, and Jeremiah yells at them in Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? So look at verse 6 and 7, and I'm winding up. Look what happened. For the Lord has caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses, the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. That's what they said. They fled for their lives. Now, did you get what happened? They thought that God, they thought that the king of Israel had hired some help, outside help. So the reason why the Syrians left is because that army attacked them. But you know what, brethren? Here's the beauty of the story. There's nothing but four leprous men. God used sound effects. We think we, could, we, we, think we are modern with sound effects. God used sound effects. Watch this. Four leprous men falling apart as they walk, and God made the Syrians hear the sound of chariots and horses and thundering tanks, and it's only four leprous men. Can God stand in our behalf or what? Four leprous men, and every step sound like a tent, sound like a, sound like a tank, sound like a, 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 a destroyer, sounds like a massive army coming their way, and the Syrians fled for their lives. It was noise for the Syrians. It was peace for the leprous men. Look at verse 8. Since you want to hear how the story ended. 
And when the lepers came into the outskirts of the camp, or to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank. You think they were happy? <sighs> it never seen people falling apart enjoying food while they fall apart. That's how our lives are. We're falling apart enjoying the blessings of God. They went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it, look what they carried, silver and gold and clothing. Only God can do that. And they went and hid them. And it says, then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. And look at verse 9. Then they said to one another, this ain't right. Then they said to one another, this is not right. Read it in your Bible. Here it is. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of what, friends? Good news. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, let us go and do what? Tell the king's household. These four leprous men were no longer rejected because they were the bearers of good news as we read in verse 18 of 2 Kings 7. So it happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king. The very blessing that was going to be inside of the city of Samaria. I want you to grab this. Where did the blessing come from? I don't ask questions. Where did the blessing come from? Where did the blessing come from? Okay, we know that, but where did the blessing come from? God took the enemy's supply and gave it to his children. And he brought it on the backs of four men whose lives are falling apart. You see, brethren, when your life doesn't look like it's worth anything, it may look like it's falling apart. But if you can bring good news to those who are in more dire circumstances than you, God can make a life that's falling apart a place where God is still praised. These four leprous men came and they brought good news. You know, sometimes we miss the good news because we measure the good news by our circumstances. We look at ourselves and say, we're leprous. But God is saying, it's not your condition, but it's my ability. It's not what your supply is, but it's what my supply is. And God's supply is never exhausted. That's why I love this quotation in 2 Kings and not second kings, but prophets and kings, look at this quotation, a beautiful quotation. I'm going to invite the praise team to come up at this time. As I close, look at this. Prophets and kings, page 260. Powerful words. Look at these words. God calls upon his faithful ones who believe in him to do what, friends? To talk courage to those who are unbelieving and hopeless. Seek strength from God, the living God. Show an unwavering, humble faith in his power and his willingness to save. And finally, when in faith we take hold of his strength, look at this. He will change, wonderfully change, the most hopeless, discouraging outlook. He will do this for the glory of his name. Oh, yes. We give up because we measure good news by our circumstances. That is why the Bible used four leprous men. It didn't use four able men, four healthy men. It says God does not measure your success by how you look. God measures his success by what he's able to supply. So, so you may not look the part, but our worthiness is not based on our righteousness. It is based on the righteousness of Jesus. So what does non-perishable food have to do with anything? You ready for the hook? Because I didn't talk about perishable food all, all sermon long. What does non-perishable food have to do with anything? You see, the food in the story represents Jesus. 
the bread of life. The food in the story represents God's ability to, to provide for us through his son, Christ Jesus. When the children of Israel travel through the wilderness, they ate bread every day, and that bread, Jesus said, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. But what was the, necess what was the necessary link in the story? Say it again. I heard somebody say it. Say it again. Faith. Faith. God was able to bless those who believed, but God would not bless those who could not believe. So those who could not believe had perishable food. Donkey's heads. I'm not going to even point at anybody. <laughs> Doves droppings and barbecue children. Lord have mercy. That's perishable food. But those who believed had a camp full of good clothes, gold, silver, enough food. They ate so much they forgot their condition. That's how God is. And that's why the hook of the sermon is in the, in the passage that we have seen all of our lives. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Non-perishable food. The non-perishable food that we need in the closing hours of earth's history is a connection to Jesus. John 3, 16. Can we say it together with your eyes closed? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, what? should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is our non-perishable food. Can you say amen? Oh, you don't need more money. You don't need more garments. You don't need more computers. You don't need more things. What we need in these closing hours of our history is the person of Jesus. Would you stand and sing that song for us? When you have Christ, this is how we see the future. Let us sing a song that will cheer us by the way. In a little while we're going home. That's the eyes of faith. For the night will end in the everlasting day. In a little while we're going home. Where are we going? In a little while. shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds shall pass. In a little while we're going home. Now watch, pause for a moment. Notice what it says. They're going to be stormy winds. We're going to meet when the stormy winds are past. We're still on our way home. But the way home is a way that is not easy. It's not smooth. It's going to be rough. They're going to be challenges. You're going to have difficult days. You're not going to always see things the way that God wants you to see them. You may feel that it's just not going and you feel like perishing, but those who believe in Jesus will not perish. He is the unperishable, the non-perishable food. And by the way, he already paid the price. And I want to say that while we say Jesus gives us salvation that's free oh let's change that it cost him a whole lot more than 135 dollars he paid for our salvation provision with everything so let's sing the second stanza and we're going to have prayer what does the lord want to do us here we go the work that our hands may find to do in a little while we're going home that's right and the grace of God will our daily strength renew in a little while we're going Where are we going? Home. In a little while, in a little while, we shall cross the billows foam. We shall meet at last when the stormy winds are past. that my brothers and sisters these are days of bad news but the gospel is still good news Jesus is still that non-perishable food that we need in our lives there's a place called grace where we are all invited where illness is left on the outside of the gates of the new Jerusalem 
The homeless can walk on golden streets and live in mansions. The hopeless can feel the touch of belonging again. The abandoned and lonely are adopted into royalty. The rich and the poor become one in Christ. The outcast can sit and talk with King Jesus. And the lepers are made whole and wear robes of eternal righteousness. But only as we have faith and believe in Jesus, the non-perishable food. Our Father in heaven, yes, sometimes the world looks like Samaria, nothing good, just filth. And instead of turning to you, we digest the filth of the world, the garbage of the world, when in your presence there is an exhaustless supply of grace and strength. Then sometimes we feel our lives are surrounded by all the forces of darkness and the enemy is just waiting for us to make one false move and claim our souls. And yet caught between famine and certain destruction, we find ourselves hopeless like lepers, realizing that in just a few moments, our worthless lives will be nothing but just a pile of dust and decaying human flesh. But it's at those moments, God, that you shine. It is when we're about to give up and think that everything is exhausted, that there's no more supply of grace available for us. It is at those moments that you activate the armies of heaven to provide the blessings for us and take them from the hand of our enemies. And so, Lord, today, in this decaying, in this dying world where men and women are seeking answers to their perplexities, help us to realize it's not just the receiving of blessings, but we won't do good if we hold our peace. You've called us not only to be recipients of your grace, but to go and to tell the king's household. Send us forth from this place today with good news on our lips. The good news is still good news in bad times. Send us forth to proclaim this good news. And we ask it that Christ alone can be uplifted and that people can find that when we believe in him, we will not perish. Thank you for that promise and for that deliverance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.